Israel as a nation hit an all-time low. Their capital city lay desolate, their temple destroyed, and the walls a broken heap of rubble. To top it off, God's people are held captive by pagan powers. It is in that context that Nehemiah bursts onto the scene. His courage and leadership changes the nation. The message in this book is a metaphor for our lives. The broken walls could well picture the shattered pieces of our lives. Get ready, buckle up, and let's see how God intervenes. Thank you. I appreciate Michael doing that. Um, I asked him to come and read that as an introduction to this message. If you don't know where you're going, if you don't know where you've been, then you won't know where you're going. And it's essential, I think, for us to get a hold of our past in order to understand our present and in order to move forward in the future. And that's so true in our personal lives, but it's really true uh, when we read the Bible, and especially Nehemiah and the nation of Israel. Um, I am excited about this message. I'm excited about this series. Um, and we're going to cover a lot of ground this morning. We are going to cover two verses, okay? Can you handle that? It's a lot, I know. Uh, but there's so much uh, that we have to understand about the historical background of this book. Because if we don't understand the historical background and the nuances there, we're going to totally and entirely miss uh, the message and the picture that God wants us to get. There's some powerful implications here, and they're found in some rather interesting historical details. Uh, but in that story, interwoven in those details, there is a story about your life and a story about my life. And, and I really believe what Michael read is correct, that, that, the, that the metaphor of the broken walls could be a metaphor for our very lives. If you have a Bible, uh, turn to the book of Nehemiah chapter 1. Uh, if you have a Bible app, if you, if you don't have this download on your phone, some phones I think it just comes automatically, uh, but the Version app, Version Bible app, it's free, uh, it's an awesome app, I think there's about 30 versions of the Bible on there, uh, it's, it's really handy, uh, if you have trouble downloading it, see me after service, we can kind of show you how to do that, Version Bible app, Nehemiah chapter 1, and let's, let's look at verse one, uh, the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev in the 20th year, when I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. I want to skip down to verse 11. I was cupbearer to the king, Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 11 says. Now, before we get into this text, there's a lot of detail in here. I mean, as a matter of fact, there's a lot of detail. You're like, what is all that about? Uh, if I were to wrap that all up in one phrase, here's what it's all about. Uh, what it's all about is that when God provides, he guides. And, and God is working in human history. God is intervening in human affairs. He is setting the stage for national revival and ultimately world revival as he begins to set the stage for the coming of the Savior, Jesus Christ. And all of that's beginning to be captured in these passages. Now, when we read the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, if you look in your Bible, uh, they're, they're kind of about one-third in, and then we see after those books, there's a lot of other books that are after uh, these books in the Old Testament, and we're learning this as we're doing a study on Wednesday night. We're going through the books of the New Testament, and we're doing a background study on that, and we have found that the Bible's doesn't necessarily put the books in chronological order. As a matter of fact, they're arranged rather differently for a significant reason, and that's the case with these books. Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther actually are sharing the time frame 
That is the time frame towards the end of the New Testament. Although they're not at the end, these literally are kind of the last words of God, so to speak, before God goes silent in the 400 years intervening between the Old and the New Testament. And I think that's critical to understand. So these are some of the last events that God is, is pulling off before he closes the chapter on the Old Testament and the New Testament begins with the birth of Jesus. And we'll talk about that in a moment or two. Now, look with me in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. There's a lot of uh, rather confusing details in here if you don't understand what he's talking about. Uh, so we're going to just pick those out. He says, Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now, that's quite a name, isn't it? I, just, I don't know. I get a kick every time I read the name, the son of Hakaliah. Uh, sounds like he was, you know, mad all the time or something. Um, Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. And he gives us the exact time and the date. It's the month of Kislev. Here again, that doesn't correlate to our calendar. I'm not going to get into that. But it says, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa. I'll talk about those dates next week because they're rather significant. Um, he talks about the citadel of Susa. What's he talking about there? What do we know from history about Susa? And, and what was the citadel of Susa? Well, we know from history that Susa was the capital of Persia. It was the capital of the Persian Empire. And so Susa was the, the Washington, D.C., if you will, of the Persian Empire. This is where the king reigned. And, and this is where you went if you wanted to have an audience with the king. And it says that Nehemiah was there. He was in the citadel of Susa. Now, we know Nehemiah was a Jew. What's he doing here in the capital of the Persian Empire? Well, we're going to talk about that in a moment or two. In the book of Ezra, chapter 1, verse 1, we learn about Persia. We learn about Cyrus, who was the king of Persia. And it says, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fill, fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia. Now, there's a couple of verses I'm not going to get into, but you probably ought to write them down. Ezra chapter 1, verse 1 to 4, and Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 11 and 12. Jeremiah had prophesied that this guy named Cyrus, the king of Persia, would do something rather significant. And this is what Nehemiah is talking about. And this is kind of the events leading up to that. And in verse 2... Nehemiah says, one of my brothers, his name was Hanani, came from Judah. Now, when he says he came from Judah, you have to once again understand a little bit of history or else you miss the picture. Uh, you may recall the nation of Israel under King David was a united kingdom. King David brought the people of Israel together, and he conquered the nations round about. And then after David died, he left the kingdom to his son Solomon. And when Solomon took over, uh, what happened was there was a split in the kingdom of Israel, and it, and it was a divide. There were 10 northern tribes, and there were two southern tribes. And I think I have a map of that right here. You can see up top in yellow... This was the nation of Israel, the ten tribes of Israel, and then the southern tribes in pink were the uh, tribes uh, referred to as Judah. Now, the northern tribes in yellow were conquered, and they were taken captive by the Assyrians. And the ones in pink down below, the two tribes called Judah, were taken captive later on, about 100 years later, by Babylonians. And what the Assyrians and the Babylonians did when they conquered their people, they deported them. They exported them. They took over their land, and they took the people out of their, their homeland, and they made them slaves elsewhere. And, and, and we have a chart to kind of show how this happened. We've got Solomon, and then Israel divided Ten northern tribes, two southern tribes, Israel, 
Judah. Israel was taken by the Assyrians. The Babylonians were taken captive. Our uh, Babylonians took over Jerusalem and Judah and destroyed Jerusalem in the process and exported the Jewish people that were there, the two tribes of Israel. And so that's what happened. And, and, and it's right in that context that the book of Nehemiah is about to take over. Now, what happened was the Persians came in and they defeated the Babylonians. But the Persians had a different tact. Rather than exporting conquered peoples, they allowed those people to repatriate their homeland. And so that's exactly what happens here. Cyrus, king of Persia, the Bible says, the Lord moved his heart to allow the people of Israel to return to Jerusalem, to allow them to rebuild. And it's in that scenario that Nehemiah is written. Now, there's one other fact you need to know. I think we have one more chart. When the Israelites returned to Judah, when they returned to Jerusalem, there actually were three different returns, three waves of return. The first one was under Zerubbabel. Uh, Ezra chapters 1 to 6 talk about this. And then there was a second return, a wave of return, and that was under Ezra. Ezra rebuilt the temple. And then there was a third wave, and that was under Nehemiah. Nehemiah comes back to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Ezra rebuilt the temple, but the city itself, it was not protected. The walls were not protected, and so there was no stronghold. They, they were open to enemy uh, defeat if, if they had no protection. And so there were three waves of return under Zerubbabel, Ezra, Nehemiah. Aren't these some names we're running? Those Old Testament names will really flip you out, won't they? I know we have some ladies who are expecting, you know, they're always looking for a list of names. I'm going to give you about 12 today. So uh, there's a few right there. I don't know if you want to consider those or not. So that's where we land. And we're in Nehemiah chapter 1. And what's rather interesting is Esther is a rather important parenthetical note in this whole story. Because Queen Esther, she was a Jew, but she was able to rise to a position of prominence. She became queen of Persia, and she actually became the stepmother of the king of Persia. His name was Artaxerxes. That's a 35-cent word. Artaxerxes is the same guy that Nehemiah is serving with. And through an amazingly intriguing turn of events, Esther saved, Esther saved the nation of Israel. The, Haman had a plot. He was going to wipe out all the Jews. And God placed her in such a place that God saved the nation through her. And she became a woman of prominence, queen of Persia, being a Jewish woman. And she became the stepmother of Cyrus, or of Artaxerxes, who now is king of Persia, with whom Nehemiah is in service. And you see that in chapter 2, verse 1 of Nehemiah. He was in the citadel of Susa. He was cupbearer to the king, and the king's name is Artaxerxes. Woo, that's a lot of stuff, isn't it? Mercy sakes. Um, there's a passage in 2 Chronicles chapter 36. It says in verse 20, it says, He carried into exile to Babylon the remnant who escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and his successors until the king of Persia came to power. I ought to underline that. They were slaves until the king of Persia came into power. Because when the king of Persia came into power, he 
sent the proclamation that the Jewish people could go back to their homeland and they could rebuild the temple. Now, here's what's even more fascinating. When you read Jeremiah chapter 25, Jeremiah prophesied this. Jeremiah foretold all of this. And when you read the book of Daniel, you will discover that Daniel foretold all of these events. He said, you are going to be taken captive by the Babylonians and you will be there for 70 years. And guess what? History records that it happened exactly like He prophesied. It was exactly 70 years until the Babylonians then were overthrown. Persia takes over, and now Persia takes over, and Nehemiah bursts onto the scene, and God is intervening in human history to bring about his purpose. Folks, God is something, isn't he? Think about it. We're not talking believers here. We're talking talking foreign military, kings, and dictators. We're talking Cyrus, who was not a Christian. He was not a believer. He was not a Jew. He, he, he was indifferent, but yet God worked through him to bring about his will. Now, why is all this history significant? It's significant because if God is in it, then it can't get stopped. You see, if God is in it, ain't nothing going to stop it. God worked through pagan kings to protect his people. God put certain people in certain places at just the right time to make sure that his purpose got carried out. And that's where we come to Nehemiah chapter 1, where we see Nehemiah is in the citadel of Susa, and we look at verse 11, and it says that he was cupbearer to the king. We have this Jewish slave who is in a rather prominent position of influence in the kingdom of Persia. He's the right-hand man to the king. I mean, that was a very influential position. Oftentimes, the king would refer to them and ask them and and, and get advice from them and and, and confided in them. He was side-by-side by King Artaxerxes. Now, what's that tell us? It tells us that God intervenes. God intervenes into human affairs. That God's involved in Nehemiah's life. God is involved in Cyrus's life. God is involved in Esther's life. God is involved in Jeremiah's life. God is involved in Ezra's life. God is involved in Nehemiah's life. And guess what? He's involved in your life too, and your life, and your life, and your life, and your life. See, God's involved. God is engaged. God has a plan for your life. Now, church, I need your help just a little bit. Think about this. This is all going on. Roughly about 500, give or take, years B.C. I think it was 722 the Assyrians took the northern tribes of Israel. I think it was 586 B.C. when when Babylon and Persia and all that's taken place. So roughly a little more than 500 years B.C. Now you help me. When Jesus was born, where was he born? Where? Bethlehem. And why was he born in Bethlehem? Where was he going? Remember, he and Joseph, they packed up. He and Joseph. Joseph and Mary, he put that pregnant lady on a donkey, traveled her across the land. Why? Why was that the case? Because of the census. And the census was to categorize and figure out who owed what taxes, and they had to go back to their homeland. But what was happening in Jerusalem? Remember? And going to Jerusalem? Now, let me ask you this. What if there was no Jerusalem to go to? 
What if there was no Jerusalem for people to gather together to figure out what they owed? It was the center point for the Jewish nation. And if you lived in and around there, that's where you went. Bethlehem's right close. They couldn't get a hotel, so they'd stay in a barn. Before Nehemiah, there was no Jerusalem. It was desolate. There was nothing there. The walls were torn down. The temple was destroyed. There was no temple to come to. There was no Jerusalem. There was no central point for the Jewish people to return to. And so 500 years before it was to take place, God is orchestrating. He's moving the chess pieces. He's placing people in certain places, doing certain things, so that the Jerusalem would be rebuilt, that the temple would be rebuilt, that his people would return, and they would have a place to come back to. 500 years before Jesus is to be born. There had to be some place for his people to come back to. Thus, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. That's the background. That's what we've got to see in this story that God strategically places the chess pieces on the board. He put Ezra, Esther, Daniel, Nehemiah in particular places at the perfect time to accomplish his purpose. He used an unknown Jewish peasant girl to save the entire Jewish race. He used a highly educated Ezra to restore the temple. He used a relatively unknown player named Nehemiah. Before this, we've never heard of him. We've never heard of his father. We've never heard of his lineage. He's unknown, and God uses him to be a game changer, to rebuild the walls, to, to bring national revival, to, to rebuild the Jewish nation. And not just the Jewish nation, but ultimately worldwide revival because of the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. It reminds me of Romans chapter 8, verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is in it, ain't nothing going to stop it. And here's the cool thing. God is always in it. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13 tells us, God is at work in you, both to will and and to work his good purpose. He's at work in you and me, just like he was in Nehemiah, just like he was in Ezra's life, just like he was in Esther's life. God has a plan for our lives, and he is at work in our lives to bring about his purpose. And here's the cool thing. He's doing that whether you see it or not. He's doing that whether you obey it or not. He's doing it whether you acknowledge it or not because God loves you. And that's why he brought his son Jesus Christ to die on a cross. And if he can work in the life of Ezra and Esther and Daniel, Nehemiah, he can work in your life too. He wants to work in your life. Not only does he want to work in your life, he will work in your life. He is working in your life. But it works a lot better if you allow him to work in your life, if you want him to work in your life. And if you say, God, here I am, like Isaiah of old, here I am, use me. I can tell you this, when you do that, your life will never be the same. Because he'll do it. Would you stand with me this morning? I'm excited about what God's going to do in our lives through this series. I'm excited what God is doing in your life. And I promise you, he is doing things in your life. He's always there. He's always there to guide you. He's always there to love you. He wants to be a part of your life, but you have to open your heart and you have to allow him to come in.
And that begins by accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And maybe you've done that. Maybe you've accepted Jesus, but you haven't really cracked open the, 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 the deeper recesses of your life. And you've kind of had some areas that are off limits, and you've said, God, I'll let, I'll, I'll let you have this, but I'm going to hang on to this part. And I'll let you in this much, but I don't know, this over here, I don't know, God. I can handle that. Can you? Why don't you let go and let, let him do it and see how life could be different. If you've got a decision you want to make this morning, we just want you to know we're here to pray for you. There's some people in the back who would be glad to pray. You can come up talk to me. We're going to sing a song, and if God's moved your heart, just feel free to seek somebody out and let them know that you want to do something for him.